you can protect yourself and improve your position by by partnering with people, then why wouldn't you do it? Particularly as you know, if, if there's a proxy war that's going on in commerce and, and sort of geopolitics, that these companies, particularly if they're national champions, will end up becoming viable targets. They could be signed, perhaps they could have their licenses removed or nationalised. And if you're becoming a target, you want to make sure you've got as many people as possible on your side. And if you can share intelligence, then that's a really smart thing to do. Welcome to GeoPodcast, a new podcast from WTW exploring geopolitics and its impact. My name is Elizabeth Brohr, and I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm also a columnist for Foreign Policy and Political Europe, where I focus on the busy intersection of geopolitics and globalization. In each episode of GeoPodcast, I will be joined by two expert guests with whom I will discuss subjects including China and the security impact of climate change. With that, let me turn to today's topic, the importance of geopolitics in the boardroom. To help us get to the heart of the question, I'm delighted to be joined by two subject matter experts. Lord Evans, Jonathan Evans, was Director General of MI5 until 2013. Before being appointed to the top job, Lord Evans had a long career in MI5 counter-espionage and counter-terrorism. He has since served on numerous corporate boards. He's also a member of the House of Lords and chairs his Committee on Standards in Public Life. Stuart Ashworth leads WTW's political risk business from the headquarters in London. Prior to this, he spent nine years in Singapore looking after WTW business in Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan and Australia. The past couple of months have seen the Russian operations of two well-known global businesses uh, seized by the Russian government. And that happened even though both companies were already trying to exit Russia. Such cases in Russia dramatically highlight the challenges corporate boards are facing. And as regards operations in China, a new survey of German companies operating in China found that 55% plan new investments there. That's down from 72% three years ago. 58% blame poor market conditions. 44% blame geopolitical tensions and 28% blame China's economic policies, the ones targeting self-reliance, for example, made in China 2025. WTW's 2023 political risk survey showed that Russia and China now top the league of countries where companies suffer the most political risk losses. So Stuart, turning to you first, is there such a thing as pure commerce anymore? or is geopolitics overshadowing every aspect of companies' operations? Well, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation to be on the podcast, um, and also for the warm introduction as well. You know, fantastic experts. I think we'll try and live up to the, live up to the hype and the expectations. Is there such a thing as pure commerce anymore? I mean, I don't know if there, if there really ever has been. You know, international commerce is about a comparative advantage in some sort of tradable commodity, be that availability or accessibility. Um, and it's hard to think of a time when when there wasn't some sort of geopolitical lens over all of this. You know, if you go back to the Punic Wars or the Phoenicians 3,000 years ago, it was all about trying to control uh, trade, trying to control trading routes, uh, sea lanes. You know, and there's been a succession of Western European trading empires, Portuguese, Spanish, English, Dutch. Um, so geopolitics has always been out there. And in many ways, the last 80 years since the end of the Second World War is probably a bit of an aberration in history um, that there hasn't been. Uh, in a normal geopolitical lens. And part of that is because of the institutions that were established after the war. You know, the World Trade Organization has allowed trade to flourish, but increasingly trade and investment policies are being linked to national security interests. And I wanted to bring you in, uh, Lord Evans, because it seems to me that corporate boards are in a, in a really tricky position at the moment. All of this is uh, the, the geopolitical developments are, are troubling to to uh, to handle for, for any company. But on top of that, they are they are totally unpredictable. So what is the right way for boards to, to consider geopolitics when, in a way, they can really only be reactive? Well, I think the first thing is to give thought to what we mean by geopolitical risk. And the way it will play out will depend on the nature of the business. If you are a global trading organisation, if you're a global bank, uh, particularly one that uh, straddles uh, different markets, including you know, China and America, etc., then that has a different impact than if you're a manufacturer. So you need to, I always think, start with your own company. 
how as a company do you uh, make value uh, and where do the risks lie and geopolitics can lie behind lots of other risk categories so uh, supply chain risk uh, legal risk uh, operational risk of various sorts so I'm not always sure that the best thing to do is to start with the the world out there I think the first thing to do is to look at your own company what actually matters to you and then think how geopolitics impacts that now let's say you're a well-loved global brand with no political agenda and yet your operations are shut down with seemingly little justification what can you do as a board to protect yourself and minimize the risk yeah i, th I think geopolitical risk in those sense in that sense in the sense of the developing of separate power blocks across the world is going through a significant change i mean the, the general direction of travel for 20 years was towards greater globalization conversations in some boardrooms about you know whether one actually needs effectively to have a, a home base does that mean anything uh, but obviously the way in which geopolitics has developed over the last five to ten years particularly over the last five years it is in the other direction so bets that were, you know made a lot of sense 10 15 years ago might look very different today in a way you're only getting back to what was normal you know, 20, 30 years ago. So you need to take a long view on these things. And and that long view, uh, Stuart, should include people with with subject matter expertise. But what what exactly is the subject matter expertise that that companies need on their boards when it comes to to geopolitically uh, linked risk? What what sort of what sort of experts do corporate boards need in order to assess these risks as best as they possibly can? Yeah, I think there are some challenges. I guess to pick up on, on the point that, uh, that Lord Evans made is there were probably two different types of risks that boards need to think about. There's kind of macro geopolitical sort of systemic risks, which is the, you know, the power shift from east to west. We're looking at climate change. And then there's more localised geopolitical risk, which are going to impact specific industries, specific countries, specific customers and clients. And I think companies need to be aware of all of those different risks because they're going to affect them in different ways. And the most important thing is it's to understand how you can be impacted by any of those events that take place. So the so I think there's a and I guess managing political risks is a process. It's not really a product. There's no one easy solution, particularly looking at the kind of macro systemic issues. But you've got to understand if an event came to pass, what would it mean for me as a company? What risk tolerance do I have for that event? How would it impact me, my suppliers? Where would I get alternative things um, or alternative components from? Nowadays, I think uh, availability is the new innovation. You know, you need to make sure that you can get whatever components you can. And if you can't get them, you know, what's the next step? So I think that's all part of the process. Now, it's, it, then the question and the challenge is where do you draw that information from? So if you appoint somebody to kind of be the custodian of this of this responsibility, they're going to have local people on the ground. Now, that may not always that will be a slightly, I guess, uh, a tainted view on what's happening on the ground. You know, people always have a slightly more positive view of their geography when they're in it. Um, there's a lot of information out there. So one of the challenges for boards is it's sort of drinking from the fire hose. You know, there's an enorm enormous amount of information that's being thrown at you and poured at you. Uh, and how do you distill what is white noise from actually valuable information? So I think there's a huge communication part that goes on. That information needs to be consumed, understood, communicated back to the board. And then it's really trying to understand that that tolerance part around, OK, these are the 10 risks in front of us. Which five am I comfortable taking or which two am I comfortable taking? What have I committed to my my uh, my shareholders, my stakeholders? And if I'm not comfortable taking it, what are the alternatives? If the worst were to come to pass, and I think scenario planning is a great way of doing this. You know, if you take things to the natural conclusion, what does it mean for me, for my company? You know, and are we still going to be around here in 12, 24 months if these things happen? And if there's a risk, what do I do about it? How do I lay those risks off to another party or how do I get expertise in to manage those things? And Lord Evans, on that note, drinking from the fire hose, that is exactly what you have been doing for so many years in counterterrorism, when anything, everything can be a threat. And yet, as liberal democracies, we, we can't completely shield ourselves. What can companies today learn from the way Western governments have managed, uh, and, and indeed Western companies have managed uh, the terrorism threats uh, over the past uh, couple of decades? Yeah, uh, I mean, when I, when I was the head of MI5, obviously I had access to most of the intelligence flows coming into the British government. And I was a member of the, Gen the Joint Intelligence Committee. 
but I would tell you, I would read The Economist cover to cover every weekend, because actually 98% of what you need to know about the world is well known publicly. So actually, I think the, the famous and well known kind of sources of information are still very, very strong. And it's very rare that something is completely missed through open source. Counterterrorism is a bit different because there are there are two levels of it. There is, of course, the strategic level and count and terrorism threats very often uh, grow on the back of other geopolitical fault lines, uh, economic issues, cultural, religious issues. You know, we see that you know, manifested very clearly both in the Middle East and also in, in Africa. But there's also a much more granular level, which is which person is doing what now that we need to worry about. And that brought two challenges. And I can remember historically thinking about this. The first one is you desperately need high volumes of information in order to let your desk officers understand and, and have the best chance of finding out what's going on. But if you get that those those flows running, the next thing is how on earth do you make sense of this mass of material? So you've got two technology challenges. One is access and then sorting and making and getting meaning out of it. I think there, there is some very good technology now available for starting to make sense of the masses of data that many corporates have. And I think that's critically important because you, know, you can be just as lost in the, the noise as you can be sort of baffled by the silence. So that's important. Um, but also it needs to be very carefully filtered, I would say, before it comes to a board, because I mean, one of the big risks on a corporate board is you get given a board pack of, you know, 1200 pages. Uh, you can't even pretend really to have read it in detail. But if, if it's landed on your desk, then if you're in a regulated industry, you'll be assumed to, to know it all. So I think the first thing to do is actually get really effective filters and people who can pick out the stuff that matters. And, you know, there are some very good people out there who are used to handling these sort of issues and can interpret this mass in a powerful way. And can I just make a, a nerdy observation there, Lord Evans? Do you think that AI can help companies better collect all this information, all these indicators that may be out there and then uh, leave it to their own human analysts to, to pick out what needs to then be looked at further and eventually perhaps passed on to the board? Well, I think AI can probably do both. I mean, I think AI is useful at the collection level, but it's also very helpful at identifying particularly, you know, anomalous activity within a mass of data, for instance. And I think, you know, one sees this increasingly in the, in the, the legal world, that actually you don't need to have quite so many uh, you know, racks and banks of, uh, of junior lawyers because technology can help you through that. Uh, and AI, I mean, there's, you know, as we all know, there are different sorts of AI and they have different strengths and vulnerabilities. But AI undoubtedly is a useful way of making sense of vast quantities of data so long as it is correctly constructed. Somebody was saying to me, somebody very well informed yesterday, a few days ago, was saying you know, the trouble with um, large language models is that uh, they're like the most convincing sort of bluffer you've ever come across. Unbelievably convincing, very, very eloquent, full of all sorts of information, but with very little relationship to truth. So, you know, I mean, that'll change, but you shouldn't uh, go into this without recognising the vulnerabilities. Yes. Now, Stuart, if I can come back to something you said, which is if, if you have lived in a country, spent a significant amount of time there, then you you, are, you have a stronger affinity, it feels a stronger affinity for that country. But the, the way uh, some key markets are developing is that it's becoming quite risky for Western expats or undesirable uh, for Western expats to live there, even to, to spend significant amounts of time there. So what does that mean for uh, the understanding of these markets within companies where key executives don't really have a personal understanding of these countries. And yes, that they have operations there, but not involving any senior leadership, perhaps. And, and how can you assess uh, as a board, properly assess a country that you may not have ever set foot in? I mean, that is a challenge. So I mean, if you, when you've got someone that's lived in a country, and we, we've had meetings before where you can look at a, a war-torn country and you speak to the guys on the ground and they will swear blind it's the nicest place you've ever been to. Friendly people, running water, electricity. Uh, and it's amazing what you get used to, you know, when you understand the, um, you know, the local the local challenges. 
but the reality is often somewhere removed, particularly when you're trying to appeal to your, you know, your shareholders who may not have that risk appetite. Um, Having people on the ground is important, but you know one of the challenges is that if you're in a totalitarian regime, you know the media is constrained for what it can tell you. So actually, there is a limit from what you can actually get from local sources if you're kind of if you're just reading that. So you do need that that local intel. But one of the things that I think uh, Lord Evans mentioned it is is a lot of this information is out there in the public domain. If people are going to make wide political changes or they're going to um, you know, look to enact laws or to, you know, launch military operations overseas. Often these are advertised and they're signposted by social media campaigns, by, you know, pledges on the um, on the campaign trail. These things, generally speaking, don't come out of nowhere. You know, populist leaders have and increasingly have a manifesto that they need to deliver. They would have promised things that have propagated their ideas. They're building a building a, a popular support base. And when you look at what was happening, you know, with Putin sort of writing his um, his ideologies and his essays in advance as to what he wanted to do. If you look at, um, you know, sort of ranting on social media, um, you know, before the Wagner group moved uh, moved towards Moscow, you know, these things are being signposted. But you need to be alive to that. You need to understand that these, you know, these are not theoretical risks. These can genuinely happen. And you need to draw all those different uh, sources together. It's like a tapestry. You need to kind of pull those bits and pieces together. And when it does come together, it actually looks it looks pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Lord Evans, I want to bring you in again uh, on that note, yeah. the affinity to countries and how to best understand them. I think Stuart's absolutely right about those, as it were, sort of weak signals suggesting that there might be something there to worry about. I think when, when you're trying to translate that into business strategy, it's important not to assume any one future outcome. I think you've got to have a spectrum of possible outcomes and then maintain as much flexibility as you can, because you know, however brilliant the data feed, however brilliant the experience, the analyst, you can't foretell the future. So, you know, there may be a, a likely outcome, but there are going to be a range of possible outcomes. Uh, and I think it's important to keep your mind open to that. I mean, you know, the, the classic model, the sort of shell model from the 50s of, of uh, scenario planning, I think there are attractions to that because it makes makes you keep your options open, maintain optionality, and ensure that uh, you know you aren't having to pick a, as it were, pick a winner out of all these different spectrums and, and different options that are out there. So keep your flexibility, uh, but be aware of what the range of outcomes might be. And if I can just follow up with with one question for you, Lord Evans, uh, along those lines of optionality and, and exercising going through the, the different scenarios. Uh, I remember during the Cold War, Sweden had fantastic total defence exercises that involved the armed forces, obviously, all parts of the government, uh, the armed forces, civic organisations, the, Re the Red Cross and so forth, but also key companies so that they could exercise contingency scenarios involving really every part of society. D do you think uh, that such uh, such a... Um, uh, such exercises may become desirable or indeed uh, indeed indispensable again not involving uh, invasion scenarios uh, here in our western countries perhaps but but other severe national security scenarios i think that's a very i think it's a very good idea to make sure that these things are done on a a, a cross sectoral level uh, there was an interesting report by the intelligence and security committee of parliament uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about um, you know, grey zone threats, particularly in, in that particular case, talking about China and saying that in order to maintain our national security in the future, we're going to need a whole of society response. This isn't something you can just leave to, you know, the military and the intelligence services. And I think if you look at areas like anti-money laundering, financial crime, there are some good models starting to emerge where law enforcement, regulators and companies are working together on these things. None of all of those organisations have an interest in getting this right. Uh, and therefore, the, the better you can do the information sharing, the, the stronger it is. Uh, and the other one I would cite is the what I think has been quite a lot of success of the National Cyber Security Centre, partly because you know, they are humble enough to accept that they don't have all the answers here. And actually, the private sector uh, have capabilities and will have information that uh, are absolutely vital if you're to understand the nature even of some state cyber threats. Stuart, is that something that, that you think would be easily implementable on, on the private sector side, closer 
collaboration with the government, not through any sort of legislation, just uh, on, a, on a voluntary basis to go through risk scenarios involving geopolitically risky countries. I, mean, I think so. Increasingly, when you've got um, trade measures are, are kind of interwoven with defence and diplomacy that, you know, there is a, um, you know, private companies and the governments are now in lockstep. Um, and actually, everyone's got the same aligned interest. And if you're, if you can protect yourself and improve your position by by partnering with people, then why wouldn't you do it? Particularly as, you know, if you're sort of, if there's a proxy war that's going on in commerce and, and sort of geopolitics, that these companies, particularly if they're national champions, will end up becoming viable targets. You know, they could be signed, perhaps they could have their licenses removed or nationalised. And if you're becoming a target, you want to make sure you've got as many people as possible um, on your side. And if you can share intelligence, then that's a really smart thing to do, because um, there is no sign that this is abating. Uh, you know, this is going to be with us for, you know, for a, a fairly long period of time. You know, these uh, these challenging times are going to increase and you're going to want to build up these uh, the resilience and uh, the partnerships. And it can really hit any company in any situation. As we speak, the Iraqi government has said it will revoke work permits for employees of a global telecommunications company working in Iraq. And this company was clearly not expecting they would face uh, such geopolitically motivated actions, resulting from a complex chain of events. It is a clear illustration of how companies are becoming targets in geopolitical conflicts. But with that, we have run out of time. So it's time for me to, to thank Lord Evans and Stuart Ashworth, even if you don't have all the answers to, for, for flagging up all the things that the companies, the corporate boards may want to consider and give them some ideas about the options available to them. And it, it really is an extraordinary time we are living in when any company even the most benign ones, ones uh, involved in, in dairy products or beer or indeed apparel or telephony can be targeted. So with that, thank you, Jonathan Evans, Lord Evans, and thank you, Stuart Ashworth. And above, thank you all for listening to Geopodcast. Next up, we'll be examining China's trajectory with the Dean of China experts, Orgel Chef. If you want to hear more geopolitics chat, make sure to subscribe. You can find us via your usual podcast players and please recommend us to your friends and colleagues too. And if you like, you can contact me with comments and questions. You can find me on Twitter at Elizabeth Braw and that's Elizabeth with an S. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you for joining us for this WTW podcast featuring the latest perspectives on the intersection of people, capital and risk. For more information, visit the insights section of WTWCO.com. Willis Towers Watson offers insurance-related services through its appropriately licensed and authorized companies in each country in which Willis Towers Watson operates. For further authorization and regulatory details about our Willis Towers Watson legal entities operating in your country, please refer to our Willis Towers Watson website. It is a regulatory requirement for us to consider our local licensing requirements. The information given in this podcast is believed to be accurate at the date of publication. This information may have subsequently changed or have been superseded and should not be relied upon to be accurate or suitable after this date. This podcast offers a general overview of its subject matter. It does not necessarily address every aspect of its subject or every product available in the market, and we disclaimer all liability to the fullest extent permitted by law. It is not intended to be and should not be used to replace specific advice relating to individual situations, and we do not offer and this should not be seen as legal, accounting, or tax advice. If you intend to take any action or make any decision on the basis of the content of this podcast, you should first seek specific advice from an appropriate professional. Some of the information in this podcast may be compiled from third-party sources we consider to be reliable. However, we do not guarantee and are not responsible for the accuracy of such. The views expressed are not necessarily those of Willis Towers Watson. Copyright Willis Towers Watson 2023. All rights reserved.